<laughs> Good to see you again. And some of you, I'm seeing you for the first time. It's wonderful to have you, you. back and inoculated <coughs> and safe. And uh, so you may notice that I have changed the protocols moving towards the jazz festival. And uh, whether you've been inoculated or not, you can feel free to wear your mask. If you've been inoculated, you can feel free to take those mm -hmm. off here during the lecture and or move around the galleries. Randy and I feel pretty secure in our Have you inoculations that will be Jim safe and not Elizabeth as it stands. And our uh, family. We monitor that yeah. uh, every day. And I'm not going to. And so we're hoping you for can. a good jazz festival. Yeah. And as you walk <coughs> in today, you were greeted by the eye candy that I'm offering to out-of-town jazz aficionados, the work of one Sherry Smith, also known as Cream Sherry. And uh, Cream Sherry, uh, you've not, uh, you've seen her work before. Um, actually, I had slated a spotlight exhibit to contrast her work with the work of Barbara Gunter Stevenson, uh, two different styles of recording images of jazz and jazz musicians. And when I did not hear from the jazz committee at the end of February, and I was cautiously trying to move forward in my scheduling, I just decided I would wait. And then Sherry called me and said, hey, what gives? What's going on down there in Elkhart? We want to be there. And I said, well, look, we'll put some pieces on easels and come back and revisit a more fully blown spotlight exhibit next year. And. Um, so if you're looking at Sherry's work, she's, and you'll see her if you attend any of the jazz functions, she'll be sitting on the front row, sketching feverishly and gesturally, those are gesture drawings, which she will then have translated into those larger giclés. And in her um, idea of doing that, it changes the mood and the temperature of the color and uh, reflects the improvisational nature of jazz and her experience mm. of that. So, so you see a little uh, authentic drawing, small, right in front of the G. Clay. So if you have any other questions, Randy and I will be able to talk a little bit more. Cream Cherry, she's known as that because in the 70s she had a cooking show on cable TV in Chicago, and she owns about 5,000 cookbooks. So you told me that. Uh, so she adopted that sort of TV persona as Cream Sherry. <coughs> and she knows a lot of the great jazz musicians that have come through Chicago. Arturo Sandoval knows her very well, and so on and so forth, and a lot who are no longer with us. So uh, if you get a chance, she will be making an appearance in here over the course of the jazz weekend that's forthcoming. It actually kicks off tonight, right, at Wellfield Garden. Dave Bennett's going to be there. Um, that's what I was told, and I think John told me that. And of course, he is a favorite, as well as Joan Colasso will be at the festival this year. Randy Horst will be standing out our front door playing his bass. What? No, mm -hmm. that's not true. Uh, are you playing the jazz festival? Just down the street, yes. Where where will you be at, Randy? The Learner on Sunday. At the Learner on Sunday. Okay. Of course, if you've ever experienced any of our midwinter blues party, Randy and his colleague, uh, tell me again, because Danny, Danny Dean uh, played music for us in here. It was really great. So we'll look forward to all of the local musicians participating as, long as, as well as the uh, ones coming from out of town. Um, Dick Lehman's lecture went really well, and he's uh, done some photographs and posting on Instagram, and we'll continue to do that. You're getting the debut look at uh, Abner Hirschberger's uh, Legacy Collection. This is the condensed retrospective in the galleries that you're seeing. It starts in 1958. It comes up to around 2016. And uh, that show in its entirety is just a part of a larger body of work that I refer to now as the Abner Hershberger Legacy Collection. The exhibit is called The Abstraction of Landscape. I think you're all familiar with landscape by now, right? I prim <laughs> primed that pump for you earlier on. And um, <clears throat> very pleased because Abner's had a huge impact on our, cul on our cult cultural landscape, excuse me, 
as well as people like Tuck Langland, who I built that collection for, to hold in perpetuity, mm -hmm. and Anthony Drogi. And primarily, it's um, uh, multiple uh, things, uh, multiple careers, teacher, professor, mentor, professional artist, and also taking the work beyond Michiana, you know. And even Dick Lehman as a Michiana master, you know, he's known in Japan, he's has his work in galleries and sends it around the world worldwide. So these are high bars, high water marks, mm -hmm. and we're very pleased to be able to bring this body of work to you. And uh, so today, we have the auspicious pleasure as to have the man himself here. The guy who first looked at me and said, well, for a 24-year-old, you're a pretty smart guy. <laughs> and uh, later on, he brought me into the fold, and I taught at Goshen <laughs> College with him yeah. for six years. And uh, we've had a really great relationship now for over yeah, 30 years. That's right. But his friend Jim Steeman is here all the way from California. Yeah, Jim, stand right up there. and turn around. Right there. Who Jim roomed Jim. with Abner. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, I would say, Jim owns the largest private collection of Abner Hirschberger's work yeah. that uh, will find a home, hopefully, uh, in the area one of these days. So with that in mind and all that pressure, and today we're also filming, so I don't want anybody to use yeah. any profanity <laughs> or shout out and turn your phones off yeah. because it will catch us on film. It costs you a $5 fine if your phone goes off. <laughs> and Brian Burnett is here from New York. And you can his wife Kay, Abner and Ann's daughter. And Ann, you stand up too, because I worked with Abner and Ann to put yeah. this all together over several months, and yeah. Ann was my touchstone because I'd That's say, right. get Abner on board. Yeah, okay. Because, and she, this is definitely a family affair here to get all of this Introduce the together. girls. So Sue okay. is not here, his but, other daughter. Uh, yeah. is she are tied to a soccer schedule okay. now. <laughs> Corinna is here, back here. Corinna, you stand up and wave to everybody. Because uh, when you okay. see her in the photograph, she only is about this tall yeah. and blonde. <laughs> so, uh, you know, time marches on. So we're glad <laughs> to have the Hirschberger family, the Burnett's, yeah. and eventually uh, Sue and John, too. Yeah. And Sophia. Yeah. And Sophia. <clears throat> and you can visit with them next Tuesday from 6 to 8. If you're on the fence, we need an RSVP from you if you're going to attend the reception. That'll be a time when you can talk to all when of the speakers stop? if you like. And yeah. Lisa is working up a little light notch okay. for us, and so we need to know some numbers. So let us know Tuesday, June 22nd, 6 to 8 p.m. if you're going to attend the reception to honor Abner Hirschberger. And here he is, from Goshen, Indiana, the man himself. Okay, all right. Give him a big round of applause. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate um, your coming out for this event. And um, have, I have a very uh, long and... Um, wonderful connection with Elkhart Museum and also the Elkhart uh, uh, Artists. I was a member of um, Elkhart Artists Association or whatever they call it now, but uh, uh, I learned to know many that uh, were, um, have continued over the, the years. So that's very important um, to any artist that a community of um, support is there for them. It's sometimes artists feel uh, a little bit, um, their work is, uh, and, and their studio is a, lone, a more lonely type trip. I've often thought about um, this when I go to concerts, and uh, many at, the, uh, <coughs> at Goshen College <coughs> and elsewhere, and um, performers come, and there's a great deal of applause and excitement, uh, uh, and there should be, and they perform a number, and after each number, there's a nice applause. And an artist 
is in their studio doing cranking out, as I've said before, uh, one piece after another. And they show these uh, different places. There's never an applause. So actually, it was nice to hear the applause earlier. I thought, well, no, I'm, I, I'm in line with the musicians. Somehow I, I've made it. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, I'm um, one to have um, traveled some distance, you might say, uh, aesthetically, and my art has um, evolved from something that was quite realistic in the beginning. And I thought that um, any time one made a, a painting or a drawing of um, the land, it should represent uh, the fields in a realistic kind of way. Then other things happen along the way. Uh, one of the um, things for me was that as a teacher, I needed to um, always go back and get more uh, training and uh, art history. <coughs> and um, uh, teachers in, that come in from um, New York and other places to a place like um, Indiana University, where I had gotten a master's, um, were suddenly uh, looking at this artist that came out of uh, the flatlands. And I remember one of them, um, uh, well, I basically brought up the fact that every day we had a, a nude uh, brought uh, to the, uh, the graduate um, uh, studio. And we would um, have our uh, easels and um, be working uh, with drawings or paintings from, from the figure. And um, I basically grew up with uh, a lot of gray clothing and color was not necessarily on the docket. A lot of black, you might say, as a, one growing up as a Mennonite. And, um, Suddenly, uh, I found myself desiring to express myself uh, with color. And um, someone told me, one of my professors, who seemed to know something about uh, uh, the people, the plain people of Pennsylvania, he said, um, well, y y there's a need that you're working to fulfill, and um, he thinks that's good. And I said, well, maybe everyone should, that goes into art should come with some need, something unfulfilled, and uh, we began to think about that. I don't know if that's necessarily a, uh, a uh, requirement, but there is something in the human spirit that wants to um, fulfill those uh, pockets of, uh, that are not quite completed, uh, the feelings that we have. And um, so who knows, that might have uh, been the case here. What's on the screen right now <clears throat> is a painting um, that is um, actually, I should back that up a little bit, it's a painting that I did. I did one like this, but this particular image is a, uh, a, a uh, lithograph. And um, when I learned to uh, do lithography, I was able to um, uh, work with uh, line and color. And it had the kind of um, the look of, of a painting. Now, um, the reason that I have um, organized it in layers, as you see on the screen, is that I wanted to um, be able to um, portray, portray simultaneously a couple of things. I wanted the corn stalks, the cornfield to be close up, 
I did a lot of uh, cultivating of corn and with a tractor and the corn would be coming through or coming uh, on both sides rather close to the driver of the tractor because the corn is uh, while it starts out quite short uh, increases to uh, uh, four and five uh, feet, six feet, and, and sometimes beyond uh, by a maturity. Uh, corn was a major uh, uh, crop that we grow, uh, grew in um, North Dakota. And uh, this was near Fargo. And most of the work that you see on the screen today will be from uh, that experience in Dakota. We got to North Dakota by way of Nebraska. We had uh, basically, uh, we're all a family member, uh, a family of 10 kids were all born at Milford, Nebraska. Um, and um, basically, my older siblings assumed that that's where they would um, remain. However, at some point, um, a, uh, an acquaintance of my father uh, kept writing to him asking whether he might come and be um, the deacon, what they call the preaching deacon at Castleton uh, Mennonite Church near Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, this was a little shocking to my older siblings. Uh, I'm the ninth of ten, so all of my uh, brothers and sisters, uh, for the most part, are older than I. And they, um, they had some question about doing this, and so there were um, discussions, and um, finally my father one morning announced to the family, I was only about three or four at the time, but I was told he announced that um, he heard a call. He heard it clearly. God called. He spoke. God spoke to him uh, during the night. And apparently my mother, who had her own mind of saying things, said, uh, uh, that's strange. I was there the whole night. All I heard was heavy snoring. <laughs> there was no call that she detected. And um, anyhow, uh, I don't know if that was the first lie that my father told <laughs> about being a minister or being a preacher or not. But anyhow, we moved to North Dakota on a farm. We were uh, looking, I think my father was also needing to uh, uh, have more land to farm. And um, in, North, in Mil uh, Nebraska, things were pretty uh, uh, tight in terms of uh, expansion and for that, of that nature. So um, <clears throat> we moved to uh, Dakota. Uh, and um, of course, um, it's kind of a hard place to start out with what we call the hard winters. Winters were quite um, cold and uh, many blizzards and uh, those kinds of things that, that happen. Um, but we had a large brick house and uh, good fireplaces and, and uh, stoves that were, um, uh, we knew how, we learned how to uh, operate and often they were, um, one, of, one of the main one was a, a kind of an oil stove and centrally located in the house uh, in uh, dining, living and uh, near the kitchen. Uh, so this was a, uh, a way of life for us. There was no bathroom indoors, only an outdoor and uh, the chamber pot as uh, they were called back then. And um, so it was a, uh, a kind of a difficult um, uh, way to uh, carry on with the size family that we had. 
However, with that same number of children and members of the family, there was um, a lot of hands to help with the work around. Uh, it was a, I think, a quarter section of land. And uh, my older sisters uh, tended to um, work out of the home, first of all, with um, helping um, young families that were part of the church. And that was uh, uh, done with a, um, without pay, but as an expression of, of helping. And then they began to uh, take on other work elsewhere. And, uh, but a lot of the, uh, if I'm recalling it properly, uh, the income that they had, the wages they earned, uh, would be contributed back to the family. The, uh, the farming was also uh, supported in part by uh, trucking, and we did a lot of um, uh, trucking at that, uh, that helped with the, uh, uh, with the income of, of the uh, family. So anyhow, uh, that's a long introduction, as it were. But um, I want to uh, go back to the images that um, we have on the screen. And um, uh, I think I'm, I don't know if I'm going forward or not here. A very, a very early uh, work at um, Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas, where I had uh, started, basically started my uh, college work was um, uh, there was a, a, an artist who um, uh, painted an image of a fish on a platter. Uh, Rudy Pizzotti, he was not um, a fisherman. It wasn't about fish. But um, uh, he said there was something about the imagery and the, the design of, of fish that attracted him. And um, so I picked up with um, that theme and did this uh, early uh, painting in, I think, 1958 it was. And um, uh, my, uh, re my particular experience was that the family was not, they were not fish eaters. So to choose a fish and celebrate it as this is, was rather unusual uh, direction for me to start out. But I love the design and I love the way it kind of worked with the platter and then also um, uh, developing a background. In other words, an artist uh, composed pictures <coughs> to put everything kind of into some kind of uh, context that, that's workable for them. Um, early in my experience, um, I was, uh, I guess, during the Second World War, there were um, uh, the expectations that uh, young people uh, were um, drafted and went into the armed services of one sort of an, or other. I had a, a couple of brothers who were ab about the age that would be, uh, uh, their contemporaries would have done that. But they had gotten farm deferments. And um, I think that because we were a rare group up there in Dakota, there, weren't, there wasn't a heavy demand for uh, farm deferments. Uh, the, the local board seemed to uh, be really uh, fine with it. They actually visited a great deal with my father who uh, talked about his point of view of uh, world peace. And uh, he developed some very um, wonderful connections with the, the local uh, board and those folks. Um, am I going in the...
I, I'm thinking I got, okay. Um, this one. Um, th this is the, uh, the image that I uh, wanted to uh, talk about as having to, having to do with um, uh, an eight-year-old and um, taking uh, milkweed, uh, that these plants that you see into the right of the canvas. Uh, <clears throat> these were um, uh, growing in the area. And um, my teacher said that, un understood um, that we were pacifists and um, said, you know, uh, one of the things that um, uh, you might consider for me, um, I think the others were bringing, they were buying war bonds or something like that, said that if you brought um, um, the, the silk from the milkweed, they go into life preserving jackets. And was very happy that there would be that option. And so essentially, excuse me for a moment. I have, a, I thought I brought water here somewhere. Okay, let's take a sip. Uh, the, uh, the, the milkweed pod being used in these um, uh, vests and uh, life preserving jackets was really very much part of what my family felt would be a, a useful and a, an important theological thing to do. So um, um, I remember hearing the stories about that in such a way that I was um, more than just impressed, I thought, that it was a way to be particularly constructive in uh, bringing something of um, something that was important in s saving lives, as it were. So that that is the upper right hand corner, uh, the um, milkweed pod. Below that is the. Uh, Dove, and uh, another reminder of peace. And below that uh, is a coiled barbed wire. Any farmer knows that we uh, coil the wire, we roll it up when we're stringing a fence, putting up a fence, and unroll it and uh, have it stapled to posts and so forth. Um, that was a, um, a way to um, somehow bring, for me, elements of my f farm life that I knew in another kind of way, bring it into this composition that uh, was uh, made up of the elements that, uh, that I worked with. The tractor tire through the center for me, um, made for a, a very strong um, vertical connection that held both the left and the right together. The uh, uh, image on, on the left uh, is one of me, uh, as I indicated earlier, at about um, age uh, eight, I believe that was. and. Um, I used the, the image to contrast uh, in a very strong way the black and white elements of, um, seemed to me, the theology of our, of our family. Uh, we often talked about being in the world, but not of the world. Uh, it never quite dawned on me uh, what that was about. And something that I began to kind of um, 
uh, quarrel with. I wanted to be, I wanted to be part of the world. I wanted to be part of uh, the the art and the uh, and the excitement and and uh, all of all of the elements uh, that were um, present for our family and for uh, a a, uh, a useful life. Um, so I I I didn't like. The, the concept uh, all that much. And um, one of my uh, professors, I was telling him about this, and he said, well, I think you're in art to change that. You're going to change it the way you feel that it should be. Um, I didn't really go into art the, with that kind of mission. I went into art because I simply liked to draw a great deal, and um, always did. And um, so it wasn't a matter of wanting to uh, change somehow the behavior of uh, those around me. Uh, I think that um, one other thing that I would just add here is that uh, there, there was an element in our local community that um, I, I guess of expectations. And I've thought about being, when you're a very small minority in a community, um, what do you do with that? What are those expectations? Should one act on that? Should you? Uh, try to uh, teach from it, express it. In many, many ways, it happened in a very unusual and rather disguised way. And it had to do with uh, evolving from realism in art to abstraction, abstract expressionism. Uh, that's really what uh, evolved for me. Uh, <clears throat> the image on the left is uh, one that um, I envisioned um, sitting on the John Deere tractor going back and forth in those big, uh, that big section of land, 640 acres we had. Um, and I'm trying to uh, imagine how this is, um, how, how might I best present this work. Uh, it evolved in unusual ways. The one uh, that you see presently on the screen, the images, uh, instead of rigorous uh, field forms, seem to be of floating. These are, um, this is a way of expressing uh, space without a vanishing point. For many, many years, I worked with drawings of um, vanishing, a vanishing point, where, which meant that uh, lines of perspective move back to a particular point on the horizon, and you line up the fields accordingly, or uh, the roads and telephone poles and so forth. Buildings will line up with that. But then there's another way of de uh, defining space, and that would be with um, uh, overlapping forms in the way that you would see here. And um, uh, I was um, quite taken with uh, tearing papers, painting on these, and running them through a uh, press, an etching press. So it's really the pressure of the uh, roll, the, 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 the uh, press uh, that pushes the color into the, um, the uh, paper that's provided. That's how that uh, image is done. <coughs> More of these um, images uh, follow, 
And of course, um, along with describing uh, fields, uh, there were some circular forms that were made with irrigation sprinklers. We had that uh, used in the um, uh, large fields that we had. And those would leave a kind of design that really intrigued me. That became part of the uh, imagery that found its way to some of my work. Then on this one, I'm not sure how well you see it, but the upper uh, third is, um, or upper half, I should say, uh, is embossed, and that's another system that is used uh, to actually get the paper to um, have a texture on it. And once again, that's done with an etching press. The uh, print, it's another uh, uh, print on the left. These are about, uh, I think it's 22 by 30 <coughs> inches. And that image is um, one that um, uh, has a, a border. I have never really used borders on my, uh, artwork in, in this manner. But there was something about the combined imagery, imagery that I had with these field forms that I wanted to somehow contain them or hold them together uh, compositionally. And I think that's the reason I chose to, uh, to work it in that manner that you see there. Well, all of this, um, <clears throat> led to, um, uh, later on, working with fiberglass and the imagery on this uh, print, it's a, uh, another uh, lithograph, um, is the imagery of um, a sculpture that was done with fiberglass. Uh, after teaching a few years, uh, I guess it was at Goshen, I went back to uh, school at the University of Michigan to get my MFA. And um, when I got there, I uh, basically was working in painting. And um, one day, uh, I well, really the first day that I was meeting with a major professor, uh, it wasn't right at the beginning. It was about a third of the way into the term went to my studio uh, to show him what I was doing. I had about three or four paintings. <coughs> Opened the uh, studio, I got to the studio, and I said, this, my, the lock has been picked. And we opened and looked in, and sure enough, the paintings were, were stolen. Someone uh, took four, three or four of the uh, paintings that I had, and uh, I kind of marvel, even this day, we drive through, um, if we go to Ann Arbor, we drive through the streets looking, uh, if we can, in the windows to see <laughs> it, where they might be, even today. Uh, you know, paintings hang around for a long time. And so if any of you are going um, that way, please take a look in the windows and see if you uh, see imagery like this. If it has this kind of form, it's likely a Hirschberger painting. Anyhow, what happened was that um, I was working, that was a major in painting and a minor in uh, sculpture. And uh, the prof said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, you know, my sculpture is going better than the painting. And could I switch the major? And so they had a conference about that and decided it would be, uh, would be a good thing. And lit frankly, I think they were too happy to do that because they were, in a way, responsible for you know, keeping uh, safe studios for us. Anyhow, I switched to um, uh, working with sculpture, and fiberglass was 
was not all that um, uh, present in the, um, in, in the area, so that the uh, form that you have up there now is a combination of uh, fiberglass uh, pieces. The, the image um, on the, the screen now is, is that translated into a painting. And so I went back to painting and combined both the sculpture and the, and the painting with, uh, developed them with the imagery that came out of, of that uh, experience. The, um, <clears throat> the painting, as you see, uh, again, I'm sorry, uh, this is uh, going to be an, uh, an etching because I can see the embossing of the uh, uh, trees at the bottom. That uh, light area that you see, I wanted those negative white shapes to take on a special look that were built in and around the, uh, the tree forms. Now the tree form, this, this painting, I'm sorry, this uh, particular uh, etching, I can tell was made after we had been to Italy because one of the things that we noticed when we went to, uh, on a sabbatical at Perugia uh, was that um, the images, uh, the trees were often kind of hovering up on the, the hills, tops over the hills. They, they'd line them up. I don't know exactly what, but why. But it, I think it's because the Italians have always found a way to make something a little different, a little more exciting, uh, to um, challenge somehow the status quo. Uh, we found that with so much of the life uh, that uh, we learned to appreciate in, um, uh, in Italy, the sabbatical year that we had. We lived at a, a large, a large how home, uh, house, I guess, 52... Palazzo. Palazzo, how many, 52 rooms, I think, was it? I forget, whatever. 500 years old, uh, 25 rooms. <laughs> thank you. Why don't, why don't you get up here and do this? <laughs> yeah, it was uh, like 500 years old. It, it was stone uh, walls, thick walls. If you heated the interior, the, uh, the whole house would just stay warm after long after you turned the stove off. And uh, the person that I rented from, Robert Barnes, was uh, one of my professors at, at IU. He said, um, the word is that you, I know he, from my experience, he's rented to various people, he managed to be there and, and cope and, and know how to handle the uh, stove. How did that happen? And I would think without uh, thinking, I said, well, I grew up in North Dakota. We had uh, oil stoves there. We had a lot of cold weather. We had a lot of snow. We knew how to handle adversity. And um, he uh, took that as, uh, as an answer that worked. And then um, told me of all the persons who he's rented that we've managed to uh, uh, pull it off better than anyone. And apparently, uh, students of his at Indiana University would go over. They thought this was cool. Well, it got too cool. And <laughs> they were soon moving on. Um, I want to say a, a word about color. I started earlier about that. But I want to go back to it. And what I found was that um, I needed to, I took a, a lot of color theory. I don't know quite why that was. It seems to me I would have taken uh, courses on, um, on um, maybe many other aspects of uh, making art, but the study of color was paramount. And I uh, indicated earlier, uh, having grown up perhaps with a lot of black, 
in the Mennonite community, grace. You do not show off, you do not, oh, I'm wearing black today. I haven't uh, graduated from that uh, experience, I guess. What I noticed, strangely, is when I went to New York, they were all wearing black. I, I left uh, the Mennonite community to kind of find color, and they were all in black, <laughs> stylishly so. So um, that concludes the, uh, the imagery that I have uh, uh, on slide, and uh, I'm going to take uh, maybe a few minutes now. If there are questions, we can um, proceed with, with those. So well, once again, thank you so much for being here. And uh, uh, any question on something? Yes, over here. Uh, we seem to do a lot of uh, lithio and, and uh, printmaking, uh, which is wonderful. Do you do that because it's reproducible? Or do you reproduce Did I do that what? Because it's reproducible, you can make multiple copies? Or do you do that because you like to enjoy the technique? Well, it's probably a combination <clears throat> of liking the technique, but it's a wonderful question because it's something that I reflected on um, more after I'd, I had the experience. And I believe that um, I would answer it this way. Painting is a very lonesome job. It's, it's, you go to your studio, you do your paintings, and that's it. Printmaking you do as a group. It, I was, you need the press, you need the facility, the acid bath, all of the elements are present in a print studio, and you have to, and, and there's a, a place to work there. You go there and work with others to do the printing, and you have, they help you with uh, aspects of the of the printing. So the printing had become uh, <clears throat> a rather, <clears throat> excuse me, a rather special uh, feature or way to make art. And um, I, would, I would be inclined to say that um, um, a strong motivating factor here was um, to connect with others. And after all, you come from a family of 12, you're, you're looking for help <laughs> wherever you can. And uh, you know how to share everything, believe me. <laughs> Lots of things. I mean, there were, in cases, three to a bed. So, And I was in the middle with my brother pulling the cover both ways. It was like a roll, like a press. And I'm in the center. And I remember that during the night, I was trying to pull the cover down to uh, lower the, uh, or to increase the temperature, or let's say, uh, get, the, get it down to lower the draft is really what I'm getting at. <laughs> so, good question. Any others? Yes, back here. Sir, I, I know your reputation, but I don't know your life. Could you give us a few minutes to explain how you got from Fargo to Goshen? Yeah. How I got to... Oh, Fargo to Goshen. Um, <clears throat> well, that's um, an interesting, I guess, somewhat interesting thing. I was at um, Topeka, Kansas, on uh, working at Menninger Clinic in an alternative service uh, assignment, and my friend there, Oren Glick, uh, went to. Uh, he, he f left the, uh, the Topeka Manninger Clinic and, and went to Goshen. And I said, and then corresponding with him, why Goshen? Well, he had um, a relative, I believe, uh, in Goshen. And he said it was the most um, advanced uh, sociology program. And uh, he recommended I come to Goshen. And so, I thought, okay, I'll do that. I was at Washburn University a couple of years, and uh, I'll go and um, join him. I got to uh, Goshen and uh, to the dormitory where I thought he was and asked 
up for Oren Glick. And he said, oh, Oren moved to um, Kansas. <laughs> he, he went to Bethel College because they had something uh, that was offered that he wanted there that was stronger than Goshen, another college out in, in, uh, in Kansas. And so here I went all the way to Goshen. I hadn't planned to, um, to connect up with my friend. What are friends for? <laughs> I got there and he left. This kind of uh, happened a couple of times. And so um, I've uh, decided to make my own way and rely a little less on uh, the help of friends. Excuse me? Ezra. 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 Uh, yes, some of you know Ezra Hirschberger. He um, basically was the first full-time um, prof, art prof, at Goshen. Art Sprunger started things off. <clears throat> he was a teacher in the local high school. So he was part-time at the college, but uh, they brought in, um, they. They kind of decided, well, it might be time to have a uh, major. To have a major, he needed um, someone full time and with a uh, master's MFA or whatever it was. And so he, um, he went there and, um, and we stayed in touch. And I told him specifically, I don't think I want to go to any place where I had um, attended, uh, this, this, is, he's a, uh, this was where I'm seeking um, a teaching assignment. And he understood that, and, uh, but he, the time came when um, I had my degree, and I think I was at uh, Indiana University working on the MAT degree, had a phone call from Carl Kreider, and uh, I took this call and was curious. I didn't really want to hear from him because I wanted to go elsewhere. And uh, he said, um, uh, we would like to have you at Goshen. And I, they didn't have but one full-time person prior to this. And uh, I, I kind of was saying, why? And um, it came out that um, they needed Anne for nursing. <laughs> she had fulfilled a master's in nursing, or whatever the degree is, but uh, the, it, the nursing program was hot at, Go at Goshen. And finally, he admitted that uh, they were um, hiring, and they were happy to uh, have Anne and there were some other schools that were looking to hire her, but they wanted to grab Anne. They had to take me. <laughs> That's how I got to Goshen. <laughs> so I've lived with that for many years. <laughs> it's it's tough, but uh, particularly if you gotta you know hang on to the the what do you call them apron strings of your wife or something like that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yes. Well, that that's right. The the year I joined or came to Goshen, Ezra was uh, taking a sabbatical to England, and so they needed someone immediately, and someone would fit his particular uh, skills, and um, so I went there at that time, and I don't remember the year. Fifty seven. No. no, it's way off. 65, in 1965, and um, so when he came back, I thought, well, okay, here's my chance to go. Well, they want to keep Anne, so they found another slot for me. <laughs> so uh, how welcome could I be at Goshen College? But I've had a good life there, so I'm not complaining. Good. Yes? Now, I have one more question back here someplace. Right back there.
I didn't quite get that. How did you go about promoting your work early on in your career? What contacts did you make? How did you sell your work? How did I move it and so forth? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question because I was going from realism to abstraction. I was, and uh, my whole community was not particularly a people that I knew. It seemed they, they liked realism. And um, I would say, well, you know, um, we're in the age of jazz. <laughs> there you go, Elkhart and uh, uh, what's happening on Main Street. Some of you couldn't park because of it. But I felt there was a, there was continuity between jazz and, and um, abstract painting. I, um, I don't know, it wasn't, I wasn't particularly into jazz, but it seemed to me it represented the, um, uh, the future or the, the present. Uh, and I would have to say there was maybe one other factor. I had a professor at Indiana University by the name of Harry Engel, <clears throat> uh, an older gentleman, Jewish man who came out of Brooklyn. And he always kept selling, uh, telling me, he's, he, he knows who I am. And I said, how do you know who I am? You're from Brooklyn and I'm from Fargo. And um, he said, there's something in your community of Mennonite community that is so like the Jewish community that I uh, grew up in and that I'm still part of. I know who you are in that way. And so I kind of followed his uh, leading and he was very much into Hans Hoffman, uh, push-pull concept of floating images and getting the sense of space, not with the um, a perspective, but this example on the on the screen is good. That layering of these uh, colors gives you a way of space. You have to work your way through it, and uh, it led really to what I'm doing now because of that. Very good. Well, I'd just like to clarify. All right. Thing. Thank you all for coming. I've been Oh, yes. Uh, and, and I said, well, we're going to go to Brooklyn, and we're going to ride the uh, subway. And he said, well, we're black. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I noticed a lot of people in New York wearing black, and that's why I said, no, that's why it doesn't show the dirt. So I adopted that uh, same color. There you go. Yeah, all right. Okay. Thank you very much.